Okay, I'm going to uh, finish my discussion of uh, oil, and then I'm going to go back and talk about Japan and the U.S. and the road to war. So uh, Japan gets most of its oil from the U.S., but much nearer to Japan is what's now Indonesia. Indonesia was controlled at this point by the Dutch, uh, by Holland. Um, the, it was called the Netherlands East Indies at this point. And you can understand, and in, in saying this, I'm not, again, justifying the Japanese uh, trying to, or capturing uh, the Dutch East Indies, but I'm trying to explain their thinking, okay? I just don't want to seem like I'm being a cheerleader for Japan. Um, strategically, um, it makes some sense from the Japanese point of view, which I think is immoral, that why not... If the U.S. is going to mess with us, why don't we capture an oil supply that's near us, which is the Dutch East Indies? This is one of the things that starts Japan eyeing the Dutch East Indies and other areas of Southeast Asia, especially uh, Vietnam, which has a lot of rubber. Rubber was also a very significant uh, commodity at this time. During World War II, there were synthetic rubber that was was invented, but it um, it it that wasn't that didn't happen until the middle of the war and think about rubber uh, all the things that rubber are for but think of, think about how rubber is being used for all this these motorized uh, uh, military vehicles such as tanks and trucks rubber is significant oil's number 1 but rubber's uh, not too far behind and so japan starts eyeing the resources in vietnam and in the dutch east indies um, by the late 30s, early 40s, and their justification is is that, that the U.S., Great Britain, uh, and other European powers, they had been imperialistic in Asia. Why shouldn't Japan be imperialistic? And on top of it, unlike the rest, unlike the European powers, Japan was at least Asian, right? Um, so it didn't seem, it, the Japanese argued, that it, uh, it was necessarily as bad, that you'd have one Asian power exploiting uh, other Asian powers. Of course, this is completely self-serving, but this is the argument. So, um, oil, to kind of conclude this little discussion of oil. All the key weapon systems in World War II were oil-powered. Uh, Surface warships, including aircraft carriers, aircraft carriers were absolutely central to World War II, a point that I'm going to develop over the next couple of weeks. Submarines, airplanes, uh, including long-range bombers, tanks, and a large portion of sea and land transport. Uh, uh, oil was essential to the uh, functioning of these weapon systems. Um, it also was used, petroleum-based projects, uh, uh, petroleum-based um, products were also used uh, in the creation of munitions, uh, and also used to help create synthetic rubber. So the U.S. has an enormous advantage during World War II when it comes to oil. As I've talked about, it was producing most of the world's oil by the time the war started. Um... And the U.S. not only had enough oil for its own use, it also was able to fuel the efforts of the Allies. Once the logistics of how to ship the oil safely, and this is something that we've talked about in, in the reading, you know, how do you get U.S. supplies from the East Coast to Europe uh, across the North Atlantic? Um, well, you have to deal with the, the, the U-2s, the, the wolf packs. Uh, which was not really something the Allies had figured out until 1943. But nonetheless, once that was figured out and once the, the, the German submarines were brought under some kind of control, the U.S. is supplying Great Britain with massive amounts of oil. It doesn't have to supply the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union has oil itself uh, and other Allied powers. So the U.S., long story short, not only has enough oil for itself, but also has enough oil for its uh, allies, which is kind of a metaphor for U.S. industrial production as a whole. The U.S. is able to produce enough goods, military goods and other goods, not only for its domestic market and its, and its military 
but for the domestic markets of other nations that it was allied to, and more importantly, to the uh, military of its allied nations. Um, the Soviet Union, uh, I just want to repeat, also had the advantage of having indigenous oil supplies. Uh, Hitler, uh, although he attempted to capture the Caucasus oil fields, never is able to do that. So uh, the Soviet Union, like the United States, has a major, major advantage over the Germans in terms of oil production. What the Germans did, they developed synthetic oils uh, during World War II, uh, which really uh, assisted their war effort. Um, but the synthetic oil, it, it, they, they never really had at all the kind of oil supplies that the United States and the Soviet Union had. Uh, they performed logistical and manufacturing miracles in coming up with this uh, synthetic oil. Often this was done, by the way, with slave labor. Uh, but still, it was a major disadvantage to the Germans that they didn't have uh, indigenous supplies of oil. And plus, these, these synthetic fuel factories are, were under constant bombardment uh, beginning in 1944 and 1945. Uh, the other uh, area of uh, oil resource for Germany was the, um, the uh, oil fields in Romania. At this point in history, uh, Roma uh, Romania was a big producer of oil, which the Germans exploited. And actually, Romania is not a big producer of oil now. It is of natural gas. Uh, but the Germans were able to exploit the Romanian oil fields. But they didn't have nearly the amount of oil that the U.S. had and that the Soviet Union had. And this was a big advantage for the U.S. and the Soviet Union. One ironic point. Let's go back to the Japanese for a second. The Japanese do capture, of course, what's now Indonesia uh, in early 1942, but they never really reap the benefits of the capture of this oil rich re region. And there's two reasons for this. First of all, the Dutch had sabotaged most of the refineries uh, and oil fields in the Dutch East Indies. It took the Japanese, the Japanese captured this area pretty quickly, but the Dutch had enough time to, to blow them to pieces. So it took a while for the Japanese to, to rebuild uh, it's the manufacturing capacity that existed in the Dutch East Indies. So that was number one. Number two, and more importantly, the Japanese had a horrific time trying to uh, get this oil from the Dutch East Indies to Japan, to the islands of Japan, uh, uh, because of U.S. submarines. U.S. submarines devastated, devastated, devastated the Japanese marine fleet. And we know one of the reasons for this, one of the key reasons for this, were the code breakers that you read about this week. Uh, this is one of the really significant uh, areas in which the code breakers played a huge role in shortening World War II because I, uh, I, I don't think this was in the reading that you had this week. I think it's coming up, but it may have been in the readings for this week. U.S. submarines had so many tar They had more targets than they knew what to do with uh, because they were getting such great information from the code breakers by 1943, but especially 44 and 45. And so the, the Japanese merchant ships were just sitting ducks. And um, that was the only way that the Japanese could get oil from Indonesia to, to the home islands of Japan. So uh, Japan, which they had been eyeing the Dutch East Indies and the oil from the Dutch East Indies for so long, they never really were able to reap the benefit to, a full, to the full extent of their capture of what became Indonesia, one, because of the sabotage of the Dutch uh, before the Japanese conquered this area, but more importantly, because their, their, merchant, um, their merchant ships, their merchant navy was getting devastated, devastated by U.S. submarines with the help of the code breakers that uh, we read about this week.